thanks very much for the introduction. And it's a real honor to be the, the closing keynote speaker for this symposium. And it's kind of a, the topic of the symposium and this kind of uh, meeting is one that I, I barely could have imagined even existing. Uh, at the time I first looked at the, the day of archaeology, you know, these kind of things were sort of a weekend hobby as I'm te trying to teach myself. Uh, where's a data set that is so somewhat interesting, not too closely related to my day job that I can sort of practice on. Uh, the day of archaeology was was one thing, and then there was a Twitter feed of an American uh, Anthropological Association conference that I studied as well. And I, I published a paper on that uh, in 2012 or 13, and then, just, then wrote, included that in my tenure package at 20, 2015 at the University of Washington, uh, just as a thing to say that I was sort of interested in you know, how archaeology engages with the public and how, uh, how sort of people talk about archaeology in, in the open forum. And when the reviews came back on my tenure report, I got tenure, but the reviews were extremely critical about that paper. And someone really po pointed their figure and said, why are you letting this guy waste his time on this pointless, non-archaeological stuff? And I became very shy about that and, uh, and pretty much shelved that whole, that whole area of inquiry. And then when I received the invitation um, from Chiara some months ago, I sort of thought, okay, this, I'm sort of seeing a validation of this kind of work now. And I kind of came back out of the closet and sort of rose to the challenge and had a look into the work that um, Chiara and Marta and Mark have done and others and thought, okay, now it's time to, to re-engage. And I feel very inspired by the things that, that I've seen uh, at, throughout today and the, and the discussion that's been around. It makes me feel like we're, we're watching the uh, emergence of a new research community where these are become a sort of these are a value, valued research questions and the methods that are being demonstrated are are bona fide and produce reliable results and I feel quite inspired by that and and just recently uh, in our department at the University of Washington we've been asked to do, to write a hiring plan which is something we do every five years or so maybe we don't always hire but at least we're given a chance to envision the future of our discipline and the kind of people we'd like to have around us. And, uh, and uh, several of us actually looked at this kind of work, at Chiara's work, and said, we want someone who does that kind of stuff. We want, we want Chiara, we want people like her or her students who are doing that kind of thing. And we've been writing this kind of justification and, and motivation and job description that we'll ultimately hope to hire someone to do this kind of work. And for me, I see that as like, now this research community is established where there's a demand for it in university uh, departments. So uh, I want to offer some kind of uh, reflections on this, this, what I believe is an emerging research community, emerging set of uh, research priorities around heritage and, uh, and digital media, and then kind of uh, implement some of these ideas into kind of a preliminary study into a new uh, part of the internet that is not, has not been examined in the context of digital heritage. So I think uh, some years ago, or even many, many archaeologists nowadays, if you ask them about what is digital heritage, they will imagine something like this. This is the Colossus, one of the computers from World War II uh, that, was, that was vital for breaking the German codes. And they will be imagining, oh yeah, I would like to go to some uh, computer museum and maybe measure some things about these old computers, and that is digital heritage. But what we now know after hearing, uh, hearing all of the great work of, of today and some of the papers that are emerging, you know, heritage, digital heritage is this idea about the present people of the present engaging with elements of the past, but in through the internet and the kind of traces that are left behind through that engagement that happens around the internet. And we've heard a lot about, um, particularly about Facebook and Twitter as kind of core data sets where we can examine how people are engaging with elements of the past via the internet. And these two places are particularly rich sources. And I will talk about Wikipedia. Uh, not as a, I will move from social media to community data, community media, Wikipedia as a as another distinctive kind of internet ecosystem where we can try to understand uh, heritage in, in, uh, in the digital world. And I, I will sort of make this point that, that, that others have already made. I want to amplify the point that the idea of digital heritage as we're kind of defining it uh, through this event uh, marks a major turn, a major turning point in heritage studies in general, um, you know, where, we, where heritage studies traditionally is kind of this uh, qualitative, Critically, uh, background of the critical theory, sort of a, a somewhat uh, postmodern approach. And now we're seeing a new communi community emerge, which is more about um, data intensive ethnographies, highly quantitative, uh, and a, a different set of, of ontologies around the nature of this new kind of data that we're working on. So I'm really excited about the development of this sort of set of research questions and the emergence of this community, that, of which, uh, which I count all of you as part of. So in, in an attempt to kind of extend this work and, and, uh, and sort of homage to um, Chiara and Marta and the others that are pioneered here, 
I've been I've sort of thought about what makes sense to study. For for me as an Australian living in the United States, Brexit is kind of peripheral concern. But an area of heritage studies that I think is very central and something that everyone can recognize as a sort of core area where uh, debates are um, enacted uh, at ver varying scales from sort of individual scales to state-like entity scales is about uh, UNESCO and the process of um, enlistment of sites on the World Heritage List. And so this is, uh, I'll just give a little bit of background about that, although I will I was assume that you probably, many of you are more familiar with UNESCO and the World Heritage uh, debates and process than I am. This is uh, the uh, Nubian campaign in Egypt, which was one of the great successes of UNESCO and the World Heritage Program, where they moved a whole bunch of stuff, huge amounts of things out of the way uh, to build a dam, huge amounts of money put together, lots of cooperation, what the sort of uh, poster child of UNESCO and World Heritage. So it started in 1945, 1972 was when the main sort of uh, focus on heritage began, protecting World Heritage and Archaeology. Currently 845 cultural sites on the list. So, you know, not really a big data thing, but when we turn to Wikipedia, which we will shortly, uh, it, will, it, will, it will blossom out into, into a regular big data problem. And this, this, the, enlist, the uh, registration process is a uh, subject of substantial scholarly concern by archaeologists and historians and political science, scientists and so on, because it's quite easy to see that the process of taking a site uh, you know, from sort of a place of archaeological significance onto the list is more about political and economic uh, deal-making than really any kind of sense of absolute uh, scientific significance. And Lynn Meskell, whose work I'll mention in a, in a bit more detail, she's made the comment that the sites are more of more like proxies of territoriality and sovereignty and security rather than you know uh, any kind of objective uh, scientific or cultural merit. So I'm asking the question, uh, you know, which sites have captured scholarly attention and why? And then I will try. Then I will turn that question to popular attention and why, and try to answer that using Wikipedia. So I'll answer this question about scholarly attention via the work of Lynn Meskell. Uh, and I know there are many scholars working on world heritage, but her work, her work is very focused on that and very influential. So I'm sort of treating her as like a starting point into making sense of the, what the scholarly community uh, are worried about when it comes to world heritage sites. So this is Angkor Wat, another uh, prominent world heritage site. And you know, to the, I think to the, to the, to the non-scholar, perhaps a successful example, a place where access is very convenient and, and there's a lot of popular uh, works coffee table books, if you like, uh, that you can consume about it. But uh, Meskel's work has shown that there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the uh, work that put Angkor onto the World Heritage List was actually uh, done by exiled uh, sympathizers to the Khmer Rouge, which just perhaps puts a bit of a bad taste in your mouth uh, if you're someone who enjoys visiting Angkor Wat to bolster the t their territorial claims. A couple of other places that she has written on extensively, uh, Mapangabwe in South Africa, very complicated situation, state-supported mining efforts, and then a series of these other, the BRIC uh, country groups supporting these mining efforts, and then the South African government kind of uh, giving them a lot of uh, flexibility to encroach on the proposed territory, for which UNESCO works somewhat powerless to sort of uh, push back and say, well, you cannot claim this is a World Heritage Site if you're allowing mining sort of right on top of it. So we see some, this sort of state-level involvement that creates uh, conflicts between UNESCO and the, the state sponsors. Another one, uh, Timbuktu, and many other examples that fall into this general category, uh, Kandy in Sri Lanka, Pamara in Syria, where there are sort of state-level actors like rebel groups, uh, militias who blow things up and kill people in the World Heritage Area. And UNESCO are not keen on those kind of things going on when the registration process is happening. And um, UNESCO has documented the, how, how powerless the uh, World Heritage Committee is to do anything about that. They can observe it and make sort of comments about it, but they lack any mechanism for, for stopping it or mitigating any of that. So there's some sort of controversy around, uh, you know, how, how, worth, how worthy are these places to be enlisted if there's the side of kind of ongoing uh, terrorist or destructive processes. Uh, the Priyava here site, another one that she's written a couple of papers on, a very nice paper where she uh, got a hold of WikiLeaks and found the cables in WikiLeaks that to be extremely revealing about all of the deal making that went on, uh, not, not really between Thailand and Cambodia, this site sits right on the border uh, of the two, a contested border line where both countries claim it, but it's all of the deal making around uh, about other countries, not in Southeast Asia, Russia and the United States and the UK, about access to uh, trading ports in the area, 
and other kinds of uh, aid arrangements. But she is illuminated in this paper where she used WikiLeaks, the cables in WikiLeaks is the main source. So she made a case of uh, hyperconnectivity in the process of negotiating World Heritage Sites, where things that don't seem to be normally connected in our day-to-day -day observations or seem to have a natural connection, uh, when it comes to scrutinizing how sites get onto the World Heritage List, all of these things seem to be deeply connected in, in a way that you would, would hesitate to, to say and without appearing uh, like a sort of conspiracy theorist. She, she has found that they can be quite well substantiated through the, the WikiLeaks cable. So hyperconnectivity is a key idea with uh, states, state-level actors, rebel groups, mining companies that are state-sponsored, sort of competing and challenging the process of um, the World Heritage nomination and causing complications and uh, creating debates amongst the UNESCO World Heritage Committee about you know, how to manage this and is, this the, is the enlistment the right thing to do. So that's a sort of scholarly debate in the topics and the sites. So just keep those sites in mind because then when we turn to the Wikipedia analysis, you can try to gauge how frequently those sites pop up uh, in terms of the metrics of sort of Wikipedia importance. So community data science. We heard, uh, we've heard quite a bit about uh, social media, and we can say maybe social media data science and studying uh, Twitter and Facebook, the te text mining, text analytics of those sources. I want to introduce like a new idea or a new data source that's relevant to digital heritage. And I want to call it community data science because it's not quite the same as social media, uh, you know, where you're just kind of chattering away with, a, with loosely defined communities. This is more like an effort to do a, spe like a t specifically targeted activity that happens on the internet. And Wikipedia is just one of these. So there are some thousands of community data sort of groups on the internet that usually are using uh, MediaWiki, which is the, the content management system that Wikipedia is based on. They're using something like that to maintain, uh, maintain content and organize their community structure. So one thing that we'll see a bit of is that these communities are highly uh, hierarchical and structured, unlike the social media data sets that we look at. And that has implications for uh, the technicity of, uh, of the sort of heritage, uh, construction of heritage knowledge in these forums. So there's a group at my university, the Community Data Science Collective, and I really am just a distant admirer of this, this group. This is uh, Mako Hill and Aaron Shaw and their group. And they, their, their whole work is focused on community data science, not just Wikipedia, but Wikipedia-like groups on the internet. Uh, for example, in our city of Seattle, there's a Seattle wiki where just people sort of contribute information about the city and so on. So they've kind of defined this uh, community data science uh, way, or this approach, qualitative and quantitative methods to study online <coughs> communities. And they're focusing on how, how the, the sort of social organization and the technology that people are working with shape the outcomes of their interactions and, and with quite interesting implications. And I'll just show you uh, one of their interesting findings because it's quite relevant to how we make sense of, of uh, the heritage on Wikipedia. So they're working, you know, they claim to be big data people at the intersection of communications and sociology and human computer interaction. And now after this talk, we will put in archeology span at the end of that kind of thing as well. And I will go back and show them my slides and hopefully they will say, great, very interesting. So here's one of their most profound results, I, I believe. So we imagine, we often imagine that, you know, things on the internet have this sort of promise of egalitarianism and democracy and anyone can participate <laughs> and so on. But they have produced this fascinating uh, study where the, the title is Laboratories of Oligarchy. And they looked at some 600 wiki communities, not Wikipedia, but wiki, Wikipedia-like things. Here's the one for the Seattle wiki that I mentioned earlier. And what they found is that these communities spontaneously sort of self-organized to be, to be highly oligarchical. But there's a small number of administrators who just control everything ruthlessly. And once that group of administrators are established, so here's the number of administrators over the time, the life of this uh, online community, it quickly sort of reaches a certain height, and then no more people are added to the, to the administrative group. So once that sort of uh, leadership forms, no one else can join the leadership, right? So that's the oligarchy. And they control kind of everything. The, the rate of admin reverts, so the administrators who then undo work for other people, becomes quite high uh, fairly quickly. So it shows that the, the, the myth of the kind of online community where anyone can participate in level is totally uh, mythological. And they've demonstrated this uh, in a very general form across hundreds of wiki-like things. <coughs> so this is an important context for understanding how people participate on Wikipedia and how people write about heritage uh, in that context. Here's Wikipedia. So just one of hundreds of, of community kind of data 
uh, generating uh, organization on the internet, the best known one, and, and I'm sure the largest one, right? And, and I won't ask you, uh, you know, have you ever edited and so on, because maybe, maybe I think there's still a bit of stigma about that. It's a bit nerdy, it's a bit sort of, uh, you may feel like you know more than other people if you're editing Wikipedia a lot. But I would say, and I, th I hope one of the, uh, one of the uh, motivations that I might give you is that perhaps you ought to. By the time I've finished speaking, you may have some reason to edit Wikipedia by yourself. So this is our, our kind of case study, is can we look into these community data organized, community organizations which are data rich on the internet and find, find out something about uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites in particular, and how does that relate to, how, to the scholarly narratives about these sites and the kind of things scholars are concerned with. So you may know these things already. I put encyclopedia in quotes uh, because I, I saw uh, something from Richard Rogers about it's just an appearance of an encyclopedia rather than encyclopedia itself because of the sort of the chaotic nature of the editorial process. The reliability is a topic of ongoing interest and from time to time there are very fascinating comparisons <coughs> with a Britannica or a bunch of experts in a certain domain are asked to review articles and so on. You know, usually it comes out to be basically fine, but from time to time there, this is a very famous case where the reliability was questioned where this is uh, some sort of South American animal and some a teenager edited it to put in a fake nickname like the Brazilian Aardvark was the nickname that this person vandalized the article to put in and that stayed there for several years and then that nickname Brazilian Aardvark was found in scholarly journal articles and books published by university presses and then that those then became the citations for that nickname in the, in the, in the Wikipedia article so there's kind of a dangerous kind of circularity uh, between the, the what could be um, unreliable information that goes onto Wikipedia and then becomes pump, becomes part of the regular sort of traditional scholarly canon. Other scholarly work has looked at page views to indicate uh, all kinds of uh, get all kinds of information about uh, you know social behaviour, uh, what to try to predict which movies are going to be blockbusters, look for movement in stock prices, uh, uh, look at uh, what animals tend to be well understood, especially venomous animals. Like what's public knowledge about venomous animals? How can we where are education gaps? And there's a famous use of the flu, uh, you know, this Google flu trends or something like that, which was turned out to be not very good, but then the Wikipedia page views were as a better indicator of the severity and timing of flu outbreaks. So this is a regular kind of academic data source. And this is kind of what gave me the inspiration to, to think about libraries. Like we heard about this, the National Library of Scotland, page view, like literal page views of actual books, you know, like in terms of the circulation record, when a book is checked in and out, that's a data point that we also may want to study in the context of you know, understanding uh, heritage and how people are checking out what kinds of books about the past are people checking out and reading and do they check them out for a long time or a short time. And that's the kind of analog equivalent of a page view on Wikipedia, I think. I'm quite excited to see some of that data uh, and, and have a look into it. So I mentioned um, there's the group uh, uh, Make Up Hill about inequalities and the iron law of the oligarchy. And here's a, a, a sort of schematic of the level of permissions that Wikipedia uses. So it's not simply the case, so sure, anyone can edit, but not anyone can edit anything in any way they'd like. So you can do a little bit of editing, but then there's, there's sort of several layers of, uh, of administrative control. So it's intensely hierarchical. And there are inequalities there, even assuming equal access to the, to the internet and equal competence in the subject matter, you still need to sort of qualify and be voted up into different um, administrative categories in order to do certain things. So intensely hierarchical which makes it very different uh, from you know, Twitter and Facebook, where, things, where basically anyone can sort of say anything, more or less. And I want to make the case here that like uh, Twitter and Facebook, Wikipedia is a context of heritage production that's worthy of our scholarly attention. And I will, I will try to give some sort of preliminary sort of sketch of a, of a kind of analysis of Wikipedia as a context of heritage production. I think uh, it has great potential, and I see you know, I see the work of, of Karen Martyr and the other, others, other sort of empirical work that we've heard Mark on eBay as a new frontier that's opening up. Many rich data sets on the internet, uh, which we have ba are barely seeing the beginning of the potential to understand how do people think about the past in this kind of uh, quantitative analysis. So I'm just, I'm, I'm really quite thrilled to maybe be the first to mention Wikipedia as one of these places that, that you can do that. So. So just to make the point again, and this is another result uh, that Mako Hill and his group, uh, the Community Data Science Collective at the University of Washington have, have identified, that you know, the internet users, so all of us, and then there's a variety of filters that result in just a tiny fraction of people who can connect to the internet actually making a difference to Wikipedia. So it's quite difficult to know exactly who are the relevant population of Wikipedia editors. Right? So people that read Wikipedia, only a tiny fraction of those 
will actually get there. And I think, as you'll see the results of what I found out about um, the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, I think you will get a fairly clear picture for the kind of people uh, who are doing that, or maybe a stereotype, at the very least. Anyway, so the, but the point is that ed editors are not all the same, and they're not all like us. Okay, so a few details about the technicity of Wikipedia, because it's very, uh, it's a highly technical system, unlike, uh, it, well, Twitter and Facebook have their technical elements as well. Wikipedia has some very distinct technical elements. So um, we have people, and then we have bots, which are just a fascinating part of the whole uh, sort of knowledge generation process in Wikipedia. And then we have these software-assisted human editors, so bots that will prompt people to do serious things. And there was quite a fascinating paper recently uh, which argued that bots fight each other. So this, this line up here is bot-bot interactions, where one bot will make an edit. So a bot is a computer program that sort of automatically roams Wikipedia to detect a certain state and then change it to another state. Like, for example, if you put something in parenthesis and you leave a parenthesis off, there'll be a bot that is watching for that and will just edit the article to finish it off. So this sort of line skyrocketing up to the top there is a, where a bot has made an edit and another bot has reverted that first bot's edit. So they call it bot wars. But I should say that shortly after this paper was published, there was another paper uh, that, that gave a fairly thorough kind of uh, rebuttal to that and said, no, this, is, this analysis is flawed in some way and bots are not directly like uh, attacking each other like that. So this is a, an area of controversy and ongoing, uh, ongoing study is how, what are bots doing exactly on Wikipedia? But a fascinating kind of uh, element of the technology of, of generating content there. The editing mechanics are very interesting. So very fine game control, and you can sort of compare edits. We can get the exact time, and I'll show you some more things we can get out of edits. Um, identity management, you can have an account with a, your real name or a pseudonym or be uh, totally anonymous. You can freeze articles, and you can revert. So revert is a special kind of edit where you look at the article, you see something you don't like that was the most recent edit, and you just click a button, and it undoes that. It rolls it back to the last one. So it makes it so undoing the last change is much easier and adding some new content onto it. So there's kind of some asymmetry in the type of edits that can be done, which makes the, the edit, editing record much richer than just simply a single kind of edit. And then we have behind each article this kind of uh, opportunity for the editors to discuss with one another and resolve conflicts and just sort of chat about things. So this is kind of, uh, uh, kind of the, the, where the potential for a close ethnographic reading of knowledge generation on, on Wikipedia is possible. And we, I've just really started scratching the surface of what's happening in there. Some of them are very long. And then and a, a really uh, exciting area of scholarly work is conflict detection on Wikipedia. Which articles are focus of uh, argument? What parts of the article? What words are being argued about in the articles? Lots of uh, very complex kind of computer science work, very computationally intensive working on uh, studying Wikipedia there. And I have just used a very simple method uh, for, for this work here. This one down here shows bot activity in different uh, languages according to the size of the Wikipedia. So I'm focusing only on the English language Wikipedia, but there's dozens of them. And in the English language Wikipedia, bot activity is a fairly small proportion uh, relative to what we see in others. In other language Wikipedias, especially fairly small ones, bots dominate all of the activity. And mostly what they're doing is taking language from the English one, translating it, and putting it into the, the other language one. Or they're taking language, they're taking content from data sources, structured data sources in that language and just generating, automatically generating articles out of that, kind of, uh, out of those structured data sets. So they're a major part of the ecosystem. So let's have a quick look and see, like, what can we learn about, you know, how people are, are organizing information or managing controversies about uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites on Wikipedia as a context of, of a sort of digital heritage kind of enactment and processes. <coughs> So it's quite challenging to know like, how to organize this kind of analysis because there's so many elements of the technology of Wikipedia where interesting things can happen. Uh, it, becomes, it quickly becomes overwhelming. Like, where do we focus our energy on identifying interesting behaviors and interesting contrasts? So this is how I've done it. I will first look at a uh, very sort of superficial comparison of contrast, like the size of the article, uh, how many links out to other articles are on a Wikipedia article, and the sources cited, just like we would cite a scholarly source in our own writing, many Wikipedia articles will cite scholarly works to sort of show that the, that the claims are reliable. So I've got just a couple of very, very sort of basic variables about content. Uh, we've got something about consumption. So how many page views over the last 100 days have these articles had? And then how many other articles link into that? So how, how much does, does each article get consumed by the rest of Wikipedia? 
how many other, artic other Wikipedia articles are linking to this certain uh, World Heritage uh, page. And then we have many variables about production. And it's still not obvious to me which are the most significant ones, but here's a couple anyway. Number of edits, number of editors, size of edits, the, uh, van vandalistic, vandal vandalism, vandalizing edits, yes. Because they are often labeled by the editors. Reverts is this special kind of low energy edit I mentioned, bot activity, stuff about talk pages, all related to how the article is generated or produced. And then a couple of observations about spatial patterns. Because these world heritage sites are distributed across the world, we may want to know are they concentrated in some part or are there some inequalities? How well does the distribution resemble the real list? And then some temporal patterns. And I, we have some quite interesting observations about both of these that I'm really excited to, to share with you. So content. Uh, this one up here. So uh, you might have seen uh, Mark showed a PCA briefly of some of his uh, eBay data. This is the sort of new cool data science PCA. The same idea, clustering, but uh, UMAP and HDBD scan and then random forest. The same concept, just new clothes for that idea. And what we're seeing is um, do the articles tend to cluster according to some of these, these attributes about their a Wikipedia article? Generally not. So we can identify four or five clusters, uh, but then the purple ones are kind of unclassified ones, so which indicates that we don't get good separation of the articles along these basic um, um, variables that I just described. What seems to be sort of key variables are, I can't quite read that actually. So it's too small. Well, you'll see shortly where the big differences are. So the point is, they're, they're quite a kind of continue, very continuously. The Wikipedia pages about whether they're sites, it's not like they form into a series of discrete groups, like very short ones and very long ones. They're sort of grayed continuously. So down here, what we have, and so this is a sort of consistent visualization that I'll show as I explore many of these variables. In the yellow is the distribution of the World Heritage uh, site pages. So I was able to get about 600, five or 600 out of the 800 I could, I could get the Wikipedia page for. Um, and you know it's a challenge because Wikipedia is constantly changing. That as I rerun my analysis, many of the links have to be updated and fiddly things going on. And then in the back, uh, the purple one are 10,000 random sites across Wikipedia, just as a control sample, so we can say like, are these sites any different from an average site on Wikipedia, or or are they basically the same across many dimensions? So so 10,000 is a fairly small sample, but it still took me several days to scrape that out. So I'm, I'm just going to show you that for now. So let's have a quick look across some of these basic uh, ideas, uh, variables of content. Number of sources cited per 1,000 words, roughly the same. So this is like citation density, so controlling for the length of the article. Basically the same as the average Wikipedia article. Number of uh, links to other articles per 1,000 words, so link out density, <coughs> much the same. But the, the word count of the article itself, significantly longer. So this is a log scale down here. So we have over 1,000 words on average and just a couple of hundred words on average for, for the, the typical article. So these articles generally, what we can see about content is generally much longer than the average page. So some details about uh, consumption now. Here we've got the total page views and links from other articles into those pages. And we can see in both of these metrics, the, the World Heritage pages are significantly more than the average page of Wikipedia. So they get a lot more attention uh, people searching the internet, coming to Wikipedia, they'll more often come to a World Heritage, be going to a World Heritage page than a random Wikipedia page. And when people are editing other world, other Wikipedia pages, they will be linking to a World Heritage page more often than any other random page. Right? And so up here, um, we can see, I just have identified some of the ones that are at the top of these distributions, like the ones that are the longest and the most linked to and the most frequently visited. And maybe you can see there's Auschwitz, uh, there's uh, Petra, uh, something in Naples, uh, so that they're mostly sites that are fairly main terrible. Now, they're fairly mainstream sites that you might imagine being on someone's kind of uh, Euro tour uh, uh, itinerary, right? So um, they're not. We're not seeing the ones that Lynn Meskel was writing about, with one exception of, of Timbuktu, which seems to get a lot of interest. Um, so that this is a this is a sort of theme that I will try to to unfold in some of the other comparisons as well. So production, uh, so consumption and production things, content, basically the same. So consumption and production, they stand out a bit. So we've got um, the number of edits uh, about the same, but if we look at edits per thousand words and edit, editors, so the number of individual people making edits per thousand words per page, so we can call this edit density, right? And significantly more uh, than the average random page. So these sites, we would say, these page, Wikipedia pages about what heritage sites 
I would say, an intensively wordsmith. So a lot of effort going into crafting the text on there. And, and typically more people involved in crafting the average sentence among these sites as well. So they're getting a lot of attention by people generating the material. Uh, vandalism, they generally are getting uh, less just uh, vandalism. You can see on the lower right, there's some, a little less vandalism than the average website. And the sites that are getting most vandalized, uh, the ones I've labeled here at the top, uh, the same as the ones that are getting the most attention, which, which, which is what you would expect. Because you, you know, have 100 people going to a Wikipedia page, one of them is going to be a sort of a, a teenager with too much spare time who just wants to like, write, write something silly about their friend on, in, their, in, their, in their website, on the encyclopedia uh, entry instead. So it's the, or these articles here, we might imagine they're sort of going there on a school trip and they're just larking around and, and being vandalizing the article, something like that. The, the highly visible, high profile sites there. And reverts, the, the, this is a sort of revert vandalism correlation, as you would expect. When an article is vandalized, this high profile site, someone is seeing it fairly quickly and hitting the revert button, which is a very easy way to roll back that vandalism. They're getting about the same rate uh, as a random website. And the names of the sites that are getting vandalized, by now I'm sure you've seen some uh, familiar names, Statue of Liberty, Tower of London, Great Wall, the, the sort of high profile ones there. So bot activity, this is one of the sort of uniquely fascinating uh, characteristics of Wikipedia. Actually, the, the amount of bot activity is not different uh, from a random page. So it seems like they're, you know, the sort of bots are not discriminated. The bots are not interested in world heritage, we might say. Um, the sites that are getting the most activity with bots, these are somewhat different from the sites that we've seen in the previous, the, with the previous variables. These ones, they are not on the typical Euro tour itinerary and don't seem to be ones that are mentioned in the scholar literature either. They're, it's difficult to understand the patterning of bot activity there. They're also not very big. Um, the number of edits are not the largest and not the smallest. So it's not quite clear exactly why those ones attract uh, a high proportion of bots. These are the bots that are most active, uh, and there are thousands of bots. Um, they, these are the ones that are most active across the random pages and across the World Heritage sites. And you can see uh, a slight difference in which bots are most active there. It's difficult to explain. The QBotNG, which is the one we see mostly on our World Heritage pages, is working on vandalism, detecting vandalism and reverting it. And then, I'm not sure, is it Pied or Sidebot uh, is working on category edits. So that's a very boring part of Wikipedia where, you know, at the bottom of the page, an article may belong to several different categories, and there, and there are people that spend their whole edit editing activity is around putting articles into categories, and someone has written a bot that will, that will help with that as well. So that, uh, that bot is quite active. Amongst our sites, uh, uh, the World Heritage sites, a bot that sort of stands out uh, is not very prominent. In the random sites is this Anomi bot, which is working on reference syntax. So that's about um, you know, citations to literature and making sure they they're sort of got the, got the closing bracket and that kind of thing stuff. So this might indicate that you know, re perhaps references, there, there may be more of them, and people are more frequently made. Because there are more of them, there are more typos to be worked with, and that bot is helping with that. So I believe this is just you know, the beginning of something quite interesting about bot activity uh, on sites of interest to you know, sites that reflect uh, heritage or of interest to heritage studies and then sort of random samples of sites to see what is the sort of, what is the normal condition of bots uh, on Wikipedia. So here's my engagement with the co question of controversy. So as I mentioned before, like, this is a rich area where, where mostly sort of computer science and informatics researchers have developed a variety of quite complicated metrics uh, for identifying controversy. And I have, in reading that literature, I, that I mentioned, I saw that some of them mentioned that the talk page length uh, is quite well correlated with some of these very complicated ways of measuring it. Very computationally intensive where they compare one edit to another word by word and find out which words changed. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. But since they had said that talk page length is well correlated, I thought I can easily measure that. So here we are. Um, the, the distribution of uh, word length talk pages is somewhat larger than a typical uh, random Wikipedia page. And this distribution is very weird because I think there's some templates that are on many talk pages where there's just a thing that says, this is the talk page. If you want to do something, uh, do it. That's what we're looking at there. And these ones here are, are actual sort of people discussing stuff. So there's generally more discussion about World Heritage sites than there are about a, a random average Wikipedia page. And some of the sites um, that are getting, so reverts, edits, and then the size of the point indicates the length of the talk page. Um, once again, these ones that, these sort of high profile ones that we see in some of the, the, the longer um, articles and the ones that attract more vandalism and reverts, um, Kamara, 
Odin, Asada, Troy, Cloverfield, Time. Uh, sort of sets of sites that are fa fairly familiar and not the ones that are getting a lot of attention, uh, you know, at, like in Lynn Meskel's uh, scholarly work. And we might wonder, you know, uh, there are many, we might ask some questions about how can we explain that? Uh, and we may, I mean, we may, our first assumption might be, well, the public are stupid. They're not reading Lynn Meskel's articles. They're obviously not sensitive to the debates. If they knew what was going on, then they'd be working on these articles and discussing those topics. But maybe some of the responsibility uh, belongs to the scholarly community as well for failing to communicate the concerns about the UNESCO World Heritage Process to people in a way that they can then translate into their day-to-day -day sort of experience and consumption of these sites. So that's my pitch for you to edit Wikipedia. <laughs> so looking at the talk pages, uh, we did some, um, some topic modeling and sort of keyword analysis to try to see what kind of topics are prominent and shared across many and what's the nature of the discussion because it's quite a lot to read. Uh, this is a great opportunity for the sort of clo classical close, close ethnographic reading of the talk pages, which we haven't done yet, but, it, but it's there. The topic, the prominent topics, um, some of the keywords here may be a bit small to see, but about quality, about sort of about archiving, about referencing and supporting. So they're about kind of the technique of writing the article and the details of making a high quality article. So do we have the, do we have the right sources here? Are we using the right spelling for the names of places? Very technical details about administration and editing process. So is the article locked or unlocked? Who can edit it and so on? That's the topic. Those are the topics that are shared across most of the talk pages. After those topics, most of these are highly local things. So these are sort of clusters of words that are just relevant to that specific location. So it's, it's not quite one topic per site, but, it, but it almost, it's almost there. And this topic correlation network just shows that this is a topic that is talking about checking and accessibility about the article being locked and registered users, about the article, about external sources, article being modified in the archive. Those are the most prominent topics that other topics kind of engage with. And things like, for example, this is the topic here, Thailand, Cambodia, Khmer. So this would be the topic that is dominating the Priya of Bahia uh, site, which is right on the border of Cambodia and Thailand, which is very highly contested by those two countries in which uh, Lynn Meskel has written that at length. And that topic doesn't really connect with any other topic. So, and there, this one is, in fact, an example of where the scholarly interest intersects with the, with the community interest in the debate there. And I'll show you, I think you have it right here. So this is a grab of uh, the discussion on that talk page for that, that World Heritage site, where they're arguing about uh, what's the proper, you know, who is the proper owner of the site, and how do we express the, the controversy about the ownership of the site, and where does the border run? And so you can see, like, this is so wrong. So there's clearly some controversy being enacted in the text here. But this is actually quite rare. So we sampled the talk pages of the World Heritage Sites that Lynn Meskel talks about, and nearly all of those are about very fiddly things like spelling and orthography, like are we using the right writing system to represent the name, and hyper-local things. Like, for example, we looked, of course, at the World Heritage Sites for Scotland, and the main debate in one of the, on the talk page of one of those is the fact that one of the nearby hotels has been changed from four stars to five stars. So most of the talk pages, even on the, even on the World Heritage Sites that is a subject of scholarly debate, um, we're not seeing a lot of those scholarly debates enacted in the talk pages. They're very hyper-local concerns instead. Okay, so now I'll, I'll uh, go to look at uh, spatial and temporal patterns in the representation of uh, World Heritage Sites on Wikipedia. So at the top here, we have the list of World Heritage Sites and their location as we get it from the UNESCO uh, website. So this is where the actual sites are in the world, kind of by, by country. And we can see that... Uh, uh, you know, Europe, uh, East Asia, South Asia is where they tend to be. And here is where they are on Wikipedia. Um, and much the same kind of emphasis where uh, Europe and East and South Asia are well covered there as well. And then we can see um, you know, Africa kind of remains a dark spot. If we, we, I have another map of uh, sites per uh, number of article, uh, sorry, Wikipedia pages per number of sites per country. So a ratio, like how many, of all the sites you have in your country, how many of them have Wikipedia pages? And Africa actually looks very good on that graph because there's just one or two sites uh, per country. Yeah. And Europe kind of fades out because, for example, Italy has 50 or 60 or something and only about half of them have pages. So, so the representation is quite good on Wikipedia you know, at a sort of gross level. But a really interesting question is where are all the edits coming from? So, for example, all the people, all the sites in India, the World Heritage Sites in India, are people in India editing the Wikipedia pages about the sites in their own country? Or are the edits coming from another country? 
So Wikipedia gives us uh, some opportunity to address this question, but in a limited way. So if you have a Wikipedia account and you're editing away, uh, and I can, you can see your username in the edit logs, uh, I cannot know where in the world you come from unless you identify yourself and say, this Wikipedia li Wikipedian lives here. But if you edit Wikipedia anonymously, so you don't have an account or you forget to log in or something like that, uh, then your IP address is logged with your edit. And we can geolocate IP addresses with some precision to a city, usually. I've just located them to the to a country level. But here's the problem, is that only a small fraction of Wikipedia edits are done anonymously. So the large part of them are done by people with accounts, and we can't know for sure where they come from. But let's see how what happens when we geolocate the small fraction of anonymous edits. So, so here's the proportion, the distribution of anonymous edits across the World Heritage Site pages. You know, the modal value is probably around 0.1, about 10% of edits of any World Heritage page are anonymous and therefore available for us to geolocate. And the rest of them, we've no idea where they come from. So this is not a very representative sample of who is editing uh, sites in what country. But let's have a go anyway. And so what we're looking at here is, uh, so this, you know, this is an origin point, and then we have an arrow. So this is a person in that country who is editing World Heritage sites that are located in that country there. And it's very clear to see that editors that are located, anonymous editors located in the United States, by far dominate content production of all of the world's World Heritage sites. Uh, and especially in places where there's no kind of um, you know, historical or current uh, English-speaking population. So, so in India, for example, I think mean, Indian people can speak English for various reasons, and they are capable, seem capable of editing their own articles from within there. But many of these smaller countries that do not have uh, large, uh, you know, large middle class uh, English-speaking populations are totally at the mercy of um, uh, US-based editors for what the world knows about their world heritage sites. So I think this is very kind of profound demonstration of maybe we can say some sort of digital imperialism about the world's knowledge of world heritage. We're largely at the whim of what people in the United States want you to know about world heritage sites because most of these people are not uh, in their own countries and not, not even those sites. Uh, so the UK obviously on the English speaking and I think Italy some. And so China, you know, it's nearly all coming from uh, well, Australia and, uh, and the United States as well. So quite, quite a, maybe a fascinating and disturbing pattern, I think, that the people in the countries where most of these sites are are not really very active in communicating and constructing the knowledge about their world heritage sites. So uh, temporal patterns. This is my last kind of major topic about the world heritage sites. So it's a bit difficult. I'm still not quite sure what is the most interesting question, the most sensible uh, 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 thing to look at here. The first part here is the, the age of the page. So compared to random pages, uh, this, so this is, this is a page that was made yesterday, and this is a page that was made in 2001, which is when Wikipedia began. Most World Heritage pages appeared relatively early in the history of Wikipedia. So it seems like a thing that people felt was important for Wikipedia to have in its early days. And the average page uh, is out in this kind of uh, long tail of more recent uh, Wikipedia pages. So they're relatively, uh, mostly appear relatively early in the history of it which also sort of validates their centrality in Wikipedia. They're, most, they're longer and they're, most, they're very frequently linked to by other pages. This graph may not mean anything, but here's the, the this is the year that the uh, World Heritage Site was inscribed on the World Heritage List. And then we have a distribution of when it was uh, appeared in Wikipedia. So these are pages that appeared after inscription. It makes sense because many um, inscribed in 1983, This is the the distribution of years of inscription down here. You know, most World Heritage sites were inscribed before Wikipedia existed, so we should expect them to be down here. And then a small number of them have had, a small number of World Heritage sites had Wikipedia pages before they were inscribed uh, on the World Heritage list. So we might, we might have a question about, like, is there some causal effect? Like, if a site appears on Wikipedia, does that somehow make it uh, better known or more important somehow to people who then are going to lobby for its inscription on the World Heritage list? Not clear yet, uh, but, but most of them uh, were there in the early days of Wikipedia. So it indicates you know, they're an important part of Wikipedia for that community. And I think this is the final, final piece of data. So these are, this is time series uh, edit activity, number of edits uh, per month, I think, uh, for a bunch of articles that haven't, have like 100, more than 100 edits per month between you know, 2001 and the present. And what you may be able to see uh, the, my intention, 
So each one has a red line on it, and the red line in indicates the inscription date. So that's the year when that World Heritage Site was put on the World Heritage List. So these are the subset of sites that were inscribed on the World Heritage List after Wikipedia was founded. So the question I wanted to answer here was, does the, does the, the event of inscription on the World Heritage List, which is arguably momentous and significant for the site, does that coincide with a burst of activity, editorial activity? Do people then rush to Wikipedia, maybe in anticipation of the listing or afterwards in order to sort of celebrate or commemorate or, or simply note the listing? Or is there no correlation at all? And, and you may just be able to eyeball and see that these red lines actually are, are often not at all correlated with any editorial activity. And where we do see spikes, uh, the spikes are often kind of not nowhere near it. Uh, so it's really the exception. Here's Tyre, here the exception where there's a burst of editorial activity that seems to surround the inscription event. Is there, where's another one? Maybe Troy, we could argue, has a case here, and, and Carthage. But really, it seems those are the exceptions. In the, for the majority of them, the inscription event is not of interest to the community of Wikipedia editors. What is causing them to uh, have bursts of editorial activity seems to be other things unrelated to whatever UNESCO, the UNESCO community up to. So now we have a challenge to work out what is determining um, the, the editorial act, editing activity on these World Heritage sites. And, and just from having a quick look at some of them, it's things like you know when the World Cup was hosted in the city that was, is also a World Heritage site. A lot of people go there and make little editorial changes around those other events. And the UNESCO committee's activity is, is really not on their radar at all. But here's another opportunity for sort of rich ethnographic engagement uh, with, the, with this kind of community to find out what is driving editorial activity on UNESCO sites when clearly it's not the process of the inscription that is doing so. So here's some preliminary findings on this kind of quick sketch, uh, quick you know, sort of dip into um, you know, heritage and Wikipedia. So just to summarize, the content longer than typical, but otherwise not standing out from a random site. But consumption, yes, they, do, they, are, they are outliers, heavily viewed and heavily linked to, very central <laughs> on the encyclopedia. The production, we can say, I would summarize what we know about production as they're being intensively wordsmith. So lots of activity per thousand words. Generally less vandalized, more controversial than typical according to the talk page length, which is a fairly crude indicator in the scope of some refinement there. But what we can see from then reading the talk pages is that most of the disputes are highly local or about sort of technicalities, about sort of editing mechanisms or naming and so on. And I, my suspicion is but in the, in the discussion about choice of names and spelling, there may be, uh, they may be signaling some controversy that I don't know because I'm not well familiar with, the, with those sites. So there's, I believe there's some potential for decoding some of those what appear to be trivial debates that may be representing more fundamental issues of identity uh, um, that, that, than what appears at the first sign. So I think there's something, maybe something to there. But what we can say is that the, the, you know, the articles that people like Lynn Meskel are writing and so on, whoever is editing Wikipedia is apparently not reading those articles or doesn't care uh, to sort of represent the concerns of those, the scholarly concerns, in uh, the way the World Heritage Site is represented on Wikipedia. So I believe there's another opportunity there you know, for scholars to communicate more effectively to the people who are writing Wikipedia or to become those people who edit Wikipedia. Spatial patterns, we saw very strikingly, you know, most of the editing work is happening out of the US into the rest of the world. I, I think this has some kind of, uh, you know, slightly alarming consequences about what we know about what is important about other countries' heritage. And temporal patterns, similarly, um, they're generally older, which reflects the importance of the article, I think, and the comment encyclopedia, and also the fact that there's a very poor correlation of the inscription event with editorial burstiness, which su suggests that people editing Wikipedia are not paying a great deal of attention uh, to the to the to UNESCO's sort of committee work, unlike the scholars who are obsessed uh, with the minutiae of that. So broader consequences and implications, and try to sort of link to what we know about digital heritage in in other contexts, like on Twitter and Facebook and so on. In one thing that maybe stands out about Wikipedia is the agency of the people involved is highly constrained by some of the unique technical characteristics of, of the editing process. And the culture of Wikipedia has been very much quickly come to some consensus. And the, so the quote I had on my front slide was like, uh, the controversy resolved and put in a footnote. So that's a, that's a sort of process that's very normal. See you guys. A very normal Wikipedia. And then there are a lot of um, procedures that are enacted to kind of normalize that, uh, that, that value. So that you know, sort of conflict resolution happens quickly and votes are occurred and then the whole thing is kind of buried away. 
Um, so uh, we might argue that unlike uh, Twitter and Facebook, where it's kind of unlimited and unconstrained in many ways, heritage activism is, is uh, difficult to spot on Wikipedia. But I do believe that we see it behind the scenes of the talk pages. And that example I showed of the Priya Bahia temple, the Cambodia-Thailand thing is, is probably where, the kind of thing we're going to see, where people are enacting uh, their sort of their identities and, and, uh, and arguing about which one should be prominent on this, on this side. So the talk page has great future potential. Scholarly concerns not well represented. Uh, most of the discussion is this sort of hyper-local process-oriented process and process discussion. And maybe there's some scholarly potential to sort of investigate uh, the, what has been signaled in some of those debates there. And finally, um, you know, the tension of the exquisite structure of Wikipedia, how well organized and, and regimented the process of, of communicating and uh, generating knowledge there. And then the mangle of community practice, the chaotic nature of just anyone sort of getting in there. It makes it quite difficult to sort of have a good sample and know what, what our sample is and why we are missing pieces, and then to reproduce the analysis. Uh, so there, there's some sort of, sort of technical scientific challenges as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.